This is something we've been preparing for for a long time. The idea of interpreting variance of uncertain significance is not a new challenge to us. And we started more than a year, probably several years ago, really preparing for this challenge because um, we hoped at some point we would be able to offer this sort of testing to our clients. Um, so we have really um, gone in up front and begun to build our internal database by running literally thousands of validation samples. So the more you know about a gene, the better you get about interpreting variants of uncertain significance. And if you look at variant rates for any laboratory, you'll notice that they're usually highest right around the time the lab starts doing testing for that particular gene. And then they fall over time as the laboratory gets better at interpreting the variants. And we could talk a lot about how laboratories get better at it. There's a lot of reasons for that, but it's, it's a fact and it's probably true of any laboratory. When we launched our cancer panels last year, we can look, you can look at our variant rates, which were you know, clearly highest at the time of launch, but um, have fallen significantly since then as we get better at working with those genes, we know more about them and we get more familiar and comfortable with the types of data that are available. So our approach with BRCA1 and 2 was to do that legwork ahead of time, well ahead of time, and before the launch. And so in order to do that, we made a significant investment in running thousands of validation samples and in building bioinformatics infrastructure to help us classify those variants. So at the time that we launched on June 13th, we were already thousands of samples into the game and many, many months into the game so that our variant rates could um, be significantly lower than they would have been otherwise. The other approach that we've taken to classify variants and to actually just really to enrich the community is to reach out to um, very active research groups that are involved in studying these two genes. They're obviously hugely important in the clinical community and so we have been building partnerships with some of those groups, with BIC, which is one of the biggest databases that looks at um, BRCA1 and 2 variation, um, with Enigma, which is a working group that has been working to classify, do functional studies, family studies, some of the other things we've discussed to classify variants, and to work with them on some of their projects. So we've become involved with the research and the scientific community that studies these genes, um, and I think that's been beneficial to both parties. Um, you know, we have enormous resources available, and as we go forward with testing, our databases are getting bigger and bigger all the time. That's a resource to the scientific community. At the same time, we look to the scientific community to provide us with data and experiments that help us to classify variants better. And so we've built some very productive collaborations we know will help us to better classify variants now and as we go forward in the future. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to not just classify variants at AMBRI, where we have a very strong variant classification group, but gives us a direct connection to the researchers who are really experts at working with these two genes. Um, and so we have people that we, we know we can call up and say, hey, we've got a variant. This is really tough for us to classify. Have you seen it before? What have you seen? What are, what are what are your thoughts about it? Um, and we've been very open about that, and we have, you know, very, you know, top researchers and experts in the field that are expecting those sorts of calls from us um, that we've been working closely with. The other thing I mentioned is that a lot of the resources we use to classify variants are in the public domain, and that's very important. You know, just as the Supreme Court ruled that our genes belong to all of us and not to an individual patent holder, um, a lot of this data actually belongs to the public. A lot of this data, most of this data was built with funding from the NIH, which is a public institution. Um, and this data is really valuable to all of us who worry about what our risks of cancer are and hope to be able to do something to manage them. And so um, being able to share data between laboratories that are doing testing and the scientific community is extremely important at AMBRI. Um, it's unfortunate that a lot of the data that's been collected over the past 12 to 14 years has not been shared with the public. And we feel that it's important and it really is a duty for us to share and to give back to the community. And so we have 
gone into, again, collaborations, working with ClinVar, other groups that are building public databases, and are already contributing to those databases with some of our other genes, and have made commitments as we go forward to contribute data from BRCA1 and 2 to those databases and to the public resources, so that that information will be available to individuals who are having testing everywhere. We are accumulating data at a very rapid rate. Other laboratories are accumulating data at a rapid rate. And us and lots of other laboratories are committed to sharing that data and to doing the best we can to improve, to use it to improve patient care. So the playing field will very quickly, I believe, and so do a lot of others, be leveled as we all contribute to the public resources and we all learn a lot more about testing for these genes.